and it can reach the apex and it can uh, you know the implants could fail so this is how i usually explain to the patient about the importance of uh, maintaining a good oral hygiene before you start the implant now the next thing is you should have a good consent form the to, for a consent form to be called as an informed consent form you should you should give a proposed treatment plan for the patient the reasons for this treatment plan the risks involved in this treatment of implant that you have uh, planned and the other kind of treatments like fpds or rpds the fees of your implant the fees of the other treatment their, their advantages and disadvantages everything has to be put in writing and then the patient has to understand that and the patient signature has to be sought so in order to start the treatment there are certain pre treatment aids that will help us in um going ahead with implant oncology one is a a good uh, impression taken and a cast board and an articulated cast with uh, waxed up teeth has been waxed on onto it which will help you to determine the amount of intraoperative space that is available the number of teeth that is that you are replacing and it will also help in in making a good stent also if a radiographic stent is to be made that also uh, a, a, a cast will help in uh, you know achieving a good um, making a, a good stent so i'll be explaining how to make a radiographic stent in the later of my presentation and also a cast will help you to assess the length and width of the uh, edentulous area and the depth of the edentulous area can be assessed by means of an x ray and ridge could be assessed previously we before the cbct and all came people used to assess by using ridge mapping technique by using a endodontic file with stopper on it and then going around from the buckle to the lingual surface along the ginger and along the crest of the ridge and then marking it on a section cast like this ridge can also be assessed by just by observation and also by applying local anesthetic and by using a vernier caliper like a bridge ma ma marker bridge ma mapping instrument also by palpating if you use a ridge mapping instrument then you can uh, measure the the crest of the ridge you can go more epically and and measure the width of the ridge at the uh, more epical region in mandibular uh, situations you can assess the uh, mylohyoid ridge by palpating then you can uh, check the width of the ridge by in, uh, by palpating the ridge in between the finger and the thumb and also by using a ridge mapper on the crest and also a little bit more epically so these are the different uh, methods that you can uh, uh, clinically assess and also in intraperitoneal sorry an intraoral periapical radiograph is also another tool to assess the amount of bone that is available and you know many of the people uh, may not have access to a cbct so you know still a panoramic radiograph is quite good um to uh, assess the uh, pre assessment uh, situation of uh, implant practice so the problem with the panoramic radiograph is that it can result in um, distortion so how do you assess the distortion you can see this uh, this ball bearing has been kept is distorted so in order to know how much of distortion has happened what you do is you measure directly on the um, x ray the 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 width of the ball bearing so usually the ball bearing that we use to in implantology uh, uh, is 5 mm in diameter that's a that's a universal standard so you know the uh, the width of the the actual width of the uh, the ball bearing that you used and then you measure over the x ray and then if it is 6.4 mm then what you do is you uh, divide it by the 5 5 mm which is the actual diameter of your uh, ball bearing that you have used and so this is this will give you a magnification factor for this particular radiograph so what you what you do is on a cellophane sheet you write the uh, magnification factor now you play you superimpose this uh, cellophane sheet over your uh, x ray and then you measure the distance uh, from the inferior alveolar onto the crest of the ridge and if uh, it is uh, 15.5 that you get you divide it by the magnification factor so this will the 12 mm will be the exact measurement the actual measurement actual width uh, actual length of the actual height of the crest of the ridge from the inferior alveolar nerve uh, superior portion so similarly you can mark the rest of the regions like this so dividing the uh, the measurement that you get on the x ray by the magnification factor which will give you the actual height of the uh, available space 
So this is another case, just to explain it a little bit better. So what you do is, before you take a panoramic radiograph, you keep a ball bearing over the crest of the ridge, in the middle of the crest of the ridge, and then you take a X-ray. Now what you do is, you measure the width of the ball bearing on the X-ray. So what we have got is 6.2, which is divided by 5, which will give you the magnification factor for this X-ray, which is 1.24 and the magnification ratio is, is marked. Now, what you do is you measure the mesodistal uh, width uh, in the X-ray, divided by the magnification factor, which will give you the actual uh, mesodistal measurement uh, of the edangular space. Similarly, you can uh, measure the amount of available bone that is available beneath the uh, sinus. So uh, you measure vertically the ball bearing, which is 6.4 millimeter. Now divided by the magnification factor, which is 1.28. Now the bone height on the X-ray, we know the sinus to the crest of the ridge is measured, which is 20 mm, and divided by 1.28, which is the magnification factor, will give you the actual height of the bone below the, uh, the sinus floor. And this is how I make a radiographic stent. You can mix barium sulfate, which is available in all the lab uh, supplies, supplying stores, and it is mixed with self-cure acrylic, and then you can pour it into the impression, or you can make a stent and then add a little bit of barium sulfate and self-cure acrylic. And you can send the patient with this RPD, which is uh, uh, made as a radiographic stent, and the patient can uh, you know, take a CBCT, and this will give you the, uh, the actual uh, cross-section. And this is going, sorry. Uh, this will give you the cross-sectional um, region uh, of the implantation, the, 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 the planned implant site. And this will give you a fair idea of the angulation of the implant that you're going to place, where the grafting is required and all that. And it's very simple to make. Just mix barium sulfate with your self pure acrylic. So uh, local anesthesia is the next thing. And, uh, you know, I like melamid very much and I always buy a new edition of a melamid there whenever it comes. So melamid says that when you give a local anesthesia, this is the best position for uh, giving local anesthesia. The patient should be placed in supine position, which means that the head and the uh, heart should be parallel to the floor with the feet slightly elevated, which will prevent a syncope from happening. So in order to give a local anesthesia in the maxilla, you can give a buccal infiltration. And when you come to the palatal region, you can give a, a greater palatine block or, a, or an incisive papillary block, or just you can anesthetize the lingual surface of the area where you're going to uh, place an implant. Coming to the mandibular uh, anesthesia, we know that inferior uh, alveolar nerve supplies the, the tooth uh, going through the inferior dental canal. So this is called as a uh, centrifugal kind of supply. And once the tooth is gone, that particular region, uh, the, there is no nerve supply to that particular region, meaning the nerve supply to that bone comes from the periosteum, which is called as a centripetal uh, supply. So to place an implant in the mandibular tooth, you don't need to give uh, inferior alveolar block. What you can give, do is an infiltration on the buccal surface and also an infiltration on the lingual surface. And presently, it is said that RT King has got a uh, very potent bone penetration power. So if you give RT King, that can penetrate the bone more than lidocaine, and it can give you profound anesthesia. Now for the incision that you place, you can always uh, prefer to go for a um, flapless surgery. But if you're thinking of a flap design, then it, it is uh, advocated that you always give uh, uh, a, wider in, a wider release incision, which means that you should always go one tooth and one papilla away. This is sometimes, you know, uh, when you place an implant, you may not know whether a grafting is required. So when you place a, a wider uh, flap, when you give a, a, open a wider flap, then, you know, the chances of incision line uh, gaping or uh, it, will all, it is, is eliminated. Or if you are placing a block graft, still it can accommodate this wider flap can accommodate the, the added the increased volume of the block graph that you're placing. 
So you can uh, go for a mid crustal incision or you can even try a paracrustal incision. So this is a mid crustal incision. Now, the, the golden rule, the, the, the measurements for placing implants. This is one case in which I play, I'd place an implant by expanding the bone and all. But when I placed the implant, it looked uh, quite okay. But when I re reached the prosthetic stage, I found that the impression post is etching the next tooth. And it is very difficult to make an impression. So I had to trim the impression post. And this is the uh, abutment, you know, a short abutment, which is touching the next tooth uh, re uh, was resulted. And I found it very difficult to uh, do the processes, but somehow, by God's grace, I could give a fairly good processes in this case. So the golden rule, while you place an implant, is to uh, place it 1.5 millimeter from the next tooth. Otherwise, sometimes the bone might get necrosed because of the pressure in between uh, the, the tooth and the implant um, and it, it can compromise the blood supply to the bone and also slight issues in the net connectivity and then I'm sure you did that. that's a canine and then Yes. I, uh, uh, you know, with difficulty, I had to place the implant. Why did it ha why did this happen? Because canines, it is always it is said that canines uh, usually have about 11 degree tilt towards the distal. So whenever you place an implant near the canine, you have to be very careful. This could have been avoided by making a stent. This is another case in which when I reached the prosthetic stage, I found the impression posts touching each other. Another case, in which I was trying to give a ball over denture, but still I couldn't give a ball over denture in this case because uh, the implants were, the, the, the impression posts were touching each other. Another case of impression posts touching each other, when you, uh, uh, when you have a, uh, you know, implants close by or the angulation of one implant is, uh, you know, it's not parallel to the to the next implant. So, the space measurement when you have two implants placed is in between the two implants there should be at least three millimeter of space, and also in between the tooth and the implant there should be at least one point five millimeter. Now, most of the time patients come for replacing the lower six, and you would uh, come across the, uh, the the second molar being mislated. It is always to do uh, always good to do an orthotic repositioning before you place an implant or doing an enamelloplasty by telling the patient prior that an enamelloplasty is required rather than uh, delaying the treatment till the process prosthetic stage comes. This is one case in which I had to uh, you know be at the patient's mercy because I didn't do an enamelloplasty in the beginning. So these are things that you should take care of before you start with implantology. Now about the buccolingual placement of the implant. The implant should be placed in such a way that there should be at least one millimeter of the bone buccally and one millimeter of the bone lingual to the implant. So many a times we may, we may not have enough bone buccally and lingually or most of the time buccally the, the, uh, the, uh, you will find more resorption. So there are uh, different techniques like ridge expansion, uh, ridge splitting or bone grafting. Uh, by means of which we can develop the bone uh, to place an, uh, an implant. So these are the different techniques of expanding the bone. And when you have very serious deficiency of bone, you can probably do a block grafting or a particulate grafting. And there are personally burrs, expansion burrs like tensor burr and all, which is available in the market, which will help you to expand the bone uh, quite easily than uh, in the olden times. So just to show a case in which there was uh, a, a great deficiency on the buccal surface, uh, block grafting could be done and uh, the implant could be replaced if there is, you know, inadequate bone. Now, uh, for the epico coronal placement of the implant, it is always said that you should place the implant two millimeter below the CE junction of the next tooth. Now to measure the available prosthetic space, this was one situation in which I was called to do an implant as a consultant in another case 
But when I reached there, this was the situation. The uh, you know inter occlusal space is very less at the you know, planned implant site. If you have not planned like and you have placed implant, and when you come to the prosthetic stage, the abutment will hit the next tooth, and then it will result in uh, uh, you know open bite. Then what you do is you'll try to trim the abutment screw in such a way that sorry the, the abutment in in a way that the abutment becomes very small and less retentive. So what is the available prosthetic space that is required for an implant? The minimum interact space that is required is five millimeter from the crest of the uh, the gingiva to the opposite um, uh, uh, the opposite crest of the ridge. And when the uh, abutment is very short. You know that this cementable processes will find it very difficult to stay there because uh, cementation. We have done crown and bridges. You know that you know cementable processes will always depend upon the resistance form and retention form. So when the crown height is less, the surface area is less. So the resistance form, the retention uh, is compromised. So this might uh, fail. This your processes might fail. Now we see we'll see the different type of implant that is available. There are two different type of implant. One is called as a submergible implant, and another is called as a non-submergible implant. The so submergible implant requires two surgeries. One surgery, the first surgery is to place the implant and to submerge it uh, below the gingiva, and it will require a second stage surgery to uncover this submerged implant for the prosthetic stage. So we should know some uh, 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 terminologies in implantology. The the bone preparation, what you do to place implant is in implantology, it is called as osteotomy preparation. So the receptor site preparation for implant placement is called as osteotomy preparation. And you need a separate armamentarium, a separate motor, which is called as a tissue dispenser for implant placement. You cannot uh, usually place it with your micro motor. And the implant company will supply you a specific implant surgical kit. And, and some companies have got prosthetic kits also. And they've got specific drills. Some are internally cooled, some are externally cooled, some uh, can be uh, externally and internally cooled. And the handpiece that you use is a green ring handpiece, which is called as a 20 is to 1 handpiece. Otherwise, it is a low speed, high torque handpiece. We may be familiar with blue ring handpiece that we generally use, which is a 1 is to 1 handpiece that we generally use in our lab and also in oral surgery procedures. There are also red ring handpieces, which are speed increasing handpieces. But in implantology, we use a green ring handpiece, which is a low speed, high torque handpiece. Now, at stage one, we do uh, osteotomy preparation and you place the implant there. Now, we wait for about four to six months undisturbed. This implant should be undisturbed. There should not be any micro movements on the implant. And then you submerge it and then you place a cover screw over it so that. Uh, it will prevent any ingress or put debris into it. A non submergible implant is otherwise called as a one stage implant in which there is no separate abutment. The abutment comes along or integrated with the implant. It is otherwise called as a, it has got a per mucosal extension, so it doesn't require a stage two surgery. Now, uh, for a stage one surgery, the osteotomy is prepared. This is the case which I had shown you. Uh, in the first slide. So I prepared a, a radiographic stent, which is uh, presently used as a surgical stent too. So I'm marking the implant site through the surgical stent or a radiographic stent, uh, which I've uh, already prepared. And then an X-ray is taken after the pilot drill is being done so that you know you can ascertain the angulation of the, um, the pilot drill which has gone. And probably at this stage, you can correct your angulation. Now, the implant kit comes with drills which have got uh, a series of uh, width, increasing series of uh, increasing widths. So, we grow, we go progressively increasing the, the width of the, the osteotomy site. So, the osteotomy is prepared, and this is the osteotomy preparation. Um, and now, you place the implant. Now, once you place the implant, it is good that you use a torque wrench. So the advantage of using a torque wrench is that you can measure the amount of force with which you are uh, placing the implant, which means that you know you can measure the stability of the implant, whether the implant has got 
uh, primary stability. So you can you can see on the left side it is marked. Uh, you know the, the 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 pressure is zero newtons, whereas uh, it is generally recommended that you know you need to have at least 25 to 35 newtons of primary stability to for an implant for, to call it as a good primary stability. Now you can place a cover screw over the implant. So this is cover screw being placed over the implant, and the instrument that is used to place the cover screw is called as it's just a screwdriver, but in implantology, you can uh, call it as a unigrip driver or a swell uh, head driver. So that the patient, you know, when you tell the assistant, take that screwdriver, you know, they might be confused uh, or they might be become very apprehensive. So uh, you can call it as unigrip driver or so. Now the cover screw is placed and sometimes the cover screw will be fully exposed when the patient comes out of four months or it may be partially exposed or it may not be exposed at all at the second stage. Now in this situation, you'll have to place an incision to uncover the implant and to remove the cover screw. Now the implant comes in different widths and lengths. The most important thing of an implant is the width at the crest. So if you look at the cover of the, the packet of an implant, it will be written like you know 4.5 or 3.5 into 11.5 or so. So the first section denotes the width of the implant. And the second section denotes the length of the implant. Now, you remove the cover screw and you put a So, Pravish, can you hear me? Uh, so, so, you were not audible for last one minute or so. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay. So, what I'll just go to the previous two slides. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I was saying that uh, when you see a packet of an implant, it has got uh, two sections. It says 4.5 to 11.5 in this packet. The first section, which is so your screen sharing is not visible now. Yeah, screen sharing, other people. Really? Yeah, screen share is not being. Let me see. Yes, it's now starting. Yes, sir. It's fine now. Okay. So I was telling, if you look at a packet of an implant, it, it has got two sections in this. It is in this uh, slide, it, shares, it says 4.5 into 11.5, which means that 4.5, the first section denotes uh, the width of the implant. And the second section, which is 11.5, it will denote the length of the implant. Now, after, when you reach the second stage, you remove the cover screw and you place the healing abutment, which is otherwise also called as a gingival former. And you leave it for about three to four weeks, which will help in a keratinization forming around the gingiva. And if you look at, after removing the gingival former, you'll feel like you're looking into a well. So why do you need keratinization around the gingiva? Is because the next further stages are impression making, then try in, then uh, you know, the processes comes, then you try in the processes. So different steps, are there which could result in bleeding. So if you have a good keratinization formed around the gingiva, then it will prevent bleeding from the uh, implanted site from the gingiva. So you get gingival formers of different uh, width and height according to the, uh, the, the you know, length of the gingiva that you have. Now this is the comparison between cover screw and the healing abutment. Now for the prosthetic components, it has got an abutment, an implant has got an abutment and this abutment is a portion that will support and retain a process, uh, the processes. So this abutment is connected to the implant by means of an implant screw. So I've taken an X-ray to show you that you know the implant has got sorry the implant has got a screw which connects the abutment onto the implant. Now the connection with the abutment to the implant are of uh, different types. 
what is called as an external hex connection. And you can see on the right side, right hand side, you can see an internal connection, which means that the abutment, uh, you know, it goes internally into the implant. Now, depending upon the uh, the kind of retention that you use, uh, if you use a screw to retain the processes on the abutment, it is called as a screw retain processes, in which you screw the abutment onto the implant. Whereas there is another uh, process is called as a cement retain processes, in which you use a cement to retain your uh, your processes. So uh, cement retain is like you've got an abutment like a crown and bridge, and then you make an impression, and then uh, you fill in cement onto the crown inside the crown, and then you fix it like a crown and bridge. So that is cement retain processes. Now for the rest of the impression, uh, you know, components, we should know about impression posts. Impression posts will help us in transferring the intraoral equation of the implant to a laboratory cast. The impression transfers are called by different people uh, with different names. Some people call impression posts as impression coping, transfer coping, impression transfers, all other things. Now, there are two different types of impression coping. One is called as an open tray impression coping, which, may, which is usually a long coping. Whereas there are other impression copings called as closed tray impression coping, which are usually short. And then uh, I'll be explaining about uh, the impression later. And then you should know about uh, laboratory analogs, which will represent the implant in the, uh, in the cast. So this is also called as an implant replica. And this laboratory analog will represent exact uh, measurement of the top of the implant fixture. Now, one thing that you have to be very careful in uh, implantology is that the processes should fit passively, which means that there should not be any micro gap and which is all usually ascertained by means of an X-ray between the processes and the implant. If there is a micro gap, it can lead to bacterial leakage and peri-implantitis. It can also lead to bone loss or screw fracture or abutment fracture or even bone loss. So what you do is after you place an uh, impression post, always it's mandatory that you may feel, you know, in your hand, you may feel that with your hand, you may feel that it has properly gone and seated. But if you take an x-ray, many times you see that, you know, it may not have gone in, probably because the gingiva have, uh, would have come in between the, uh, the implant platform and the abutment. Or sometimes the bone may grow over the implant and it might hinder the, the, the correct uh, passive fit of the abutment or the impression post over the implant. So uh, soon after you place the uh, impression post, you should make sure that you uh, make an x-ray. Now there are two different types of uh, impressions. One is called as a closed tray impression, and another is called as an open tray impression. Closed tray impression, uh, you can choose any stock tray, but always it is said that you know a special tray, custom made tray, is the best for uh, the patient. Now you apply tray adhesive, and you remove the uh, gingival former from the implant, and now you place the impression coping, the closed tray impression coping over the implant, and you seal the impression. Uh, uh, you know, the abutment access uh, screw hole uh, by means of uh, Teflon tape. And then you inject your uh, light body and then you make an impression like a crown and bridge impression. You set a timer so that the, you'll know whether the impression sets the, the, uh, the exact time of the impression. Usually from the time of mixing, it is four to five minutes. And now once the impression is set, you remove the impression from the mouth and the speciality of uh, close to impression is that once you remove the mouth, the impression from the mouth, the impression post stays in the mouth. Now you have to remove the impression post and attach a lab and log, and then you have to reorient the impression post back into the impression, which can result in inaccuracy. And now what the lab will do is, lab will pour the gingiva around, an artificial gingiva around the implant, which is called, which uh, will result in what is called as a soft tissue cast. And the gingiva that you pour around is called as a gingi mask or gingival monash. The advantage of closed tray is that it's very easy to do. But the problem is the impression coping doesn't come along 
will not come along with the impression. But it is fixed to the implant and it has to be reoriented, removed and reoriented in the set impression. Though it is very easy and simple like crown and bridge impression, this can result in a kind of uh, inaccuracy when you reorient it. It is good for single tooth impression. It can be used for multiple tooth impressions, but which are the, the, the implants which are parallel to each other. And this is uh, useful when the mouth opening is limited because usually the impression posts are very short, which will require a limited mouth opening. And you know you can remove it very quickly. And it is very useful in gaggles. The disadvantage is, as I said before, you have to remove and replace and, and reorient it in the impression. And it is not useful when the implants are not parallel. Probably if you use poly either, which is a very rigid impression material, your impression may not come if you have non-parallel implants if you're using a close to impression technique. Close to impression technique can also be used if you modify the impression in the mouth, like you take a current bridge impression. And also it is good for making impressions of single tooth, uh, you know, single st stage one implants in which the abutment is fixed, is attached, is integrated with the implant. So close to impressions are a good tool for making impressions in stage one implants. Second type of impression is called as an open tray impression, in which you make an opening at the implantation site. To facilitate the impression coping, the removal of the screw of the impression coping. So this can be done by trimming an impression a stock tray, but always a custom tray is the best option. You get ready-made trays in which you know you can remove the screws of that region pertaining to your implant and uh, you can make open tray impressions like that. Open tray impressions, you know, uh, are useful when, when, you, when your implants have been placed non-parallelly. Otherwise, removal, removal will be very difficult. So, as I said before, open tray impressions usually will have a longer impression coping or a screw. And the impression, at the advantage is that once you remove the impression, the impression coping, uh, you know, will get incorporated or picked up in the impression. And this will prevent uncertainty in reseating the impression copings, like uh, in a closed tray impression. So this is more accurate than a closed tray impression. The problem with this is that since it has got long copings, you will require, uh, you know, more mouth opening, especially in situations, you know, when you have placed the upper seven and all, it will be very difficult if you, uh, you know, the patient has got limited mouth opening. So this also has to be ascertained before you place an implant. The mouth opening of the patient also has to be ascertained. So you make an opening on the tray, pertaining to the region where you have placed an implant, and then you inject your light body around the implant, and then you make the impression, and your impression coping or the screw of the impression post will uh, sh will be shown through the impression that you have making. Now what you do is you'll, you'll unscrew, once the impression is set, uh, you will unscrew the impression uh, screw the, uh, of the impression coping and once you, uh, you, you remove, the, you retrieve the impression, you will see that the impression coping is picked up in the impression. So you don't need to reorient this in the impression. So which means that this is more accurate. So the advantage is that it is more accurate and you don't need to remove and replace the impression coping back into the impression uh, which you have taken. An open tray is also advantageous when in situations in which you know the implant, one implant is so much below the, 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 the crest of the, um, the bony crest of the rest of the tooth or the rest of the implant. When it is significantly below the occlusal plane, an open tray is, uh, is indicated. Now, there's another impression. Uh, the, the previous two impressions, what I was mentioning, was called as a fixture level impression. Whereas there's another impression technique called as an abutment level impression, in which you know you make the impression uh, over the abutment, of the, the multi-unit abutment, usually that you have placed over the implant. So you uh, will take the the impressioning level from the implant level to the top of the abutment that you have placed, which is usually done. Uh, in cases of all on four, which if you have done, it is a abutment level impression that you have done. 
that you, that you usually do. Now for the impression material that you use in implant, uh, polyether is the, the one that is generally you know, recommended for implantation, implantology uh, impressions. Why? Because polyether is very rigid. When you have uh, multiple implants, it will prevent the movement of the impression copies within the impression. So it is very, very good in multiple implant situation. It will prevent the movement of the impression copies within the impression. And you know, you get it in monophasic uh, form, which means that the tray material and the impression material both are the same in uh, you know imbrigum uh, the trade name for uh, polyether by cm is imbrigum so once you make the impression now what you do is you can disinfect the impression and then you send it to the lab what the lab will do is, is they'll put the cards and the uh, once the crown comes back what you do is you have to uh, screw in the the abutment screw and which is called as a pre torque now once you place the uh, torque the abutment to about uh, 30 to 35 newtons now you place the uh, cement if it's a cementable processes then you can use a uh, uh, cement to place the uh, the crown so usually it is recommended that you can use a temporary cement uh, uh, or a cement that is free from eugenol or even you can use permanent cement which is available in the market now for the occlusion with the implant it's always said that you know you should give an implant protective occlusion which means that in light closure there should not be any contact on the implant and when uh, there is a heavy contact then only there should be contact on the implants and there should not be any eccentric contact on the implant and generally you will give a mutually protected occlusion scheme. Now for the prosthetic options in implant, whether it's a screwable processes or uh, uh, cemented processes, when the screw hole comes on the uh, singulum side, especially in the anterior region, you know, it is good to give a screwable processes. When the screw hole, access hole comes in the central groove, it is good to give a screwable process. The advantage of going for a screwable process is that retrievability is very easy. You can unscrew it and then you can remove the processes. This is one of my cases, my earlier cases in which the screw hole had come to the buckle and then it looks very unesthetic. Now I try to close it with composite and then you know it looks very unesthetic. So these are situations in which you can go in for a cemented processes. When you place your implant at an angulation, you need to have an angulated abutment or you need to trim the abutment. So in such situations where your implant is angulated, uh, you know, or when the screw hole comes on the buckle surface, then a cementable processes is uh, recommended. Cementable processes comes with its own disadvantages. Cement extrusion leading to peri-implantitis is a problem. If you have a screw loosening, then it is very difficult to remove the cemented processes. You will have to uh, drill in through the occlusion surface uh, or the path of insertion of the screw access hole to find the, to fetch for the screw, which is a very difficult thing. There's another technique called as screwmentation, which is a combination of screwable and uh, a cementable processes. It can also be done. Now the problem with global process is that the centric contact will remain in composite. It may wear off during uh, use and patients may come with openings in the, uh, the screw access regions. Now for the prosthetic uh, options, you know, there are, uh, it is classified as FP1, FP2 and FP3 processes. You know, this is a recent extraction case. You can see that you know two teeth are still remaining, but the extraction sockets are still there, which means that you know you need to replace only the tooth portion, the crown portion. Uh, when you need to replace only the crown portion, it is called as an FP1 process, which will replace only the crown portion, like this. But when you need to replace the cemental cementum 
it is called as a FP2, or when you need to replace the gingival portion, or when the process has got, uh, uh, you know, you need to add gingiva, gingival porcelain onto it, which means that there is more amount of resorption. It is uh, called as FP3 process. So I'll just run through the photographs and the x-ray which I have of the patient which I showed in the uh, beginning. So this is a, a pre-operative photograph of the patient who had come to replace a post six. Uh, articulated diagnostic wax up has been made and a radiographic stent by mixing, making an RPD and uh, mixing barium sulfate with self-care acrylic has been done and a CBCT has been uh, taken and a virtual implant play, planning has been done. I do it myself. Uh, it is also uh, okay to have the uh, the center, the, the diagnostic center to uh, do the planning for you. But you know, you can be more uh, assured, you can be more accurate if you yourself do your uh, implant virtual planning. So an implant planning uh, and virtual implant patient has been done. And then the same radiographic stand has been used as a surgical guide. Uh, X-ray had been taken with the pilot drill and a post-surgical implant placement radiograph has been taken. Now, gingival former is placed after uh, four months. That's the buckle view. And then a closed tray impression post has been placed. A closed tray impression has been taken. Now I need to take this impression off from uh, the mouth and then reorient it into the impression which I've taken. And the lab will send you what is called as a jig prime. So this is otherwise called as a verification jig, which you place in the patient's mouth. And you know, this marked region, which you know shows there is no gap between the implant and the abutment, uh, a bit between the impression post and the implant or the occlusal surface of the tooth. The same thing that you see in the cast has to be there in the patient's mouth. And you, verif you verify the uh, fit of this impression post or uh, this verification jig with an x-ray. There should not be any gap between the implant and the verification jig uh, in the x-ray too. Now, you can, once you're sure that your impression is done, uh, your, your, your impression is accurate by means of verifying it with a verification jig, then you can ask for a metal trying and then the, they'll coat with ceramic and the ceramic processes, global process has come back and that is the process in the mouth. And that is the occlusal view of the processes in the mouth. That is the opposing uh, photograph of the maxillary uh, arch. And that is the post-operative x-ray that has been taken as a baseline x-ray. And uh, in order for the implant processes to be successful, you have to teach the patient about maintenance of the implant. So the difference between an implant and the tooth is that tooth has got horizontal fibers, gingival fibers going into the, uh, the cemental region. Whereas an implant, it doesn't have horizontal fibers. Most of them are parallel fibers or they are circular uh, fibers that goes around the implant. So bacteria or food debris or even cementum or, or the, the cement that you uh, used to you know, place the implant, for, that will be forced through very easily through the gingiva into the bone. Bacteria can easily go from the gingiva into the bone and will, which will result in peri-implantitis. And you know, as I said before, it can, bacteria can run through each threads of the implant like in a spiral ladder and it can reach the apex and you know, it can fail the implant like this. The problem with implant is that you know, there are microorganisms in the mouth and the implant has got an intraoral communication. And there, are, there is no horizontal fibers for the gingiva. And the implant doesn't have any periodontal ligament. So, you know, uh, in, you know like a, uh, in a tooth, it doesn't pain in the beginning. There is reduced proprioception with the implant. Patient can bite with about 80% of the force that a natural tooth will give. And still won't know how much of force they are using. So bacteria can easily ingress. Your processes can easily break. So you make a baseline x-ray when you send the patient or, or the last day of your process insertion. 
and you should always it is recommended that you take annual radiograph to assess the crustal bone level and the bone uh, the periodontal integrity and you should demonstrate how to use interdental cleaning aids and it has been it should be initiated from the first patient interaction and it should be reinforced through the treatment stages and it should be demonstrated and it should be reinforced on the day of the process process insertion and it has to be evaluated periodically you should show them tooth brushing you should show them how to clean underneath an implant processes the floss should be wrapped around the implant or a bar processes and you should move it horizontally and also you should move it horizontally and vertically the floss should be tied in a shoe shine fashion to help to clean 360 degrees around the implant processes which has to be taught to the patient like this interdental brush has to be shown in the patient's mouth and you get specified implant brushes which can which is angulated in a, in a particular fashion in which uh, by means of which the lingual surfaces of the implant processes can be reached you should show the importance of interdental brushing and you should show the uh, water pick you know you can, you can even supply water flosser from your clinic you should show how to use them and you should demonstrate and train all this during the insertion of the processes to the patient and you should check the oral hygiene within a week review after one to two weeks whether the patient is doing all that which you have demonstrated and you should review the patient after one month and see whether the process is is okay or you need to do some adjustments and i think i've completed in one hour as pravish wanted me to and this is my address yeah and sir uh, we do have many questions for you yeah uh, i think dr unni will be asking yeah thank you very much for your patient listening thank you sir thank you for that wonderful presentation from the very you have started from the very basics including the magnification factor of opj i found that very helpful thank you uh so the first question here uh, that our participants have asked is uh, what is the minimum age to recommend an implant um you know in the growing stage the the the, the difference the, the problem with an implant is that implant gets ankylosed so you know if we are placing an implant in a in a uh, growing stage what happens is the rest of the tooth will start growing whereas the implant will stay there then you'll have difficulty in in the prosthetic stage you may have to add uh, you know gingival porcelain and all to it so they say that you know generally 18 years uh, you know below 18 years it's not recommended mish says that you know 18 years is a good uh, age beyond 18 years you can place implant but certain people say that you know till 21 or 22 the the growth uh, still continues but you have you have to ascertain clinically and also uh, you know they say mish says that you know the if it's a boy if the boy has grown in uh, in a taller than his father if he has gone uh, you know mustache thick mustache then uh, probably he will be a good age to uh, place an implant but generally they said that you know less than 18 years is not generally recommended for placing implant right so 18 years yes okay so the next question is from uh, our dr mehul uh, he has been asking uh, what should be the dimension of a gingival former in terms of length and diameter for a particular implant you know the gingival former there is uh, it is determined by the uh, the height of the gingiva uh, which you can ascertain by using a periodontal probe you can remove the cover screw and you can place a periodontal probe on the crest of the implant and you can measure the amount the, the height of the gingiva and you can order a uh, gingival former according to the height of your uh, gingiva that you have now for the width of the uh, gingiva you can even customize a gingival former if you want so the width depends upon uh, you know the the amount of 
uh, diameter of the uh, situation that you want. Okay. So, but you okay. can, you know, you can get different width and different height uh, according uh, to your situation from uh, all the implant companies. Right. So it varies with each it varies, yeah. uh, So next question is, how much variation can be expected on mesial distal dimension of tooth in cast and in radiograph? Uh, I guess that depends on the radiograph. How much variation can be expected on the mesial distal dimension on the of the tooth in cast and in radiograph? I think uh, usually uh, in cast and a radiograph, which means that in, in the mouth and the radiograph. In the mouth and the radiograph, yes. Yeah, usually they say, you know, the uh, OPG magnifies by about 20% or so. I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess we will have to do that magnification factor checking of the OPG. Okay. I'm trying to enlarge the screen. Pravish, I cannot see you. Uh, you want, what do you want me to do, sir? I would like to see you. <laughs> I, can you stop the screen share. Yeah, I am yeah. there now. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So you can stop the screen share. Uh, in that case, we all will be able to see. Yeah, you. yeah, you will be able to see us in the big, bigger screen. Okay. You can just stop the screen share, sir. Let me try, let me try. Or shall I stop it, sir? Yeah, yeah, you please it. stop it because I'm yeah. unable to. Okay, all right. Yeah. And so the next question is, uh, can uh, what is the best implant system available in the market, especially in the case of single tooth replacement? Is that, do you have any recommendations for that? So I'll answer this with another question. <laughs> what is the best antibiotic that you can prescribe for a patient? It depends on the case. Yeah. Case case. So there is no best implant. Uh, it depends upon the case situation. Certain companies, they come with 3mm, uh, certain companies have got diameter of 3.5, 3.7, 4.3. Length also, also varies. Some companies have got 6.5 millimeter long implants uh, or HMM. It depends upon your situation. And uh, you know, there is no best implant as such. Okay, and single, in the, uh, with respect to single tooth replacement, what method would you suggest? Submerge or single stage for impression taking, I guess. I would always prefer a submerged protocol because especially in single uh, two situation, if it's an anterior, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when you do freehand, your angulation uh, may go more buckly. And then, uh, you know, if you go for a single piece implant, then you cannot angulate, you know, your, your prosthetic versatility is reduced. If it is a two piece implant, you can always order an angulated implant and uh, angulated abutment or you can um, trim off the buckle portion of the uh, abutment whereas once you trim off the you know you don't have so much of prosthetic versatility in a single piece implant because the abutment is uh, integrated with the implant okay okay sir. is that answer yes sir. yeah, yeah. Uh, so our next question is from uh, dr mithil she is a fellow oral surgeon uh, he has been asking about how to assess the gingival biotype Okay, gingival biotype can, could be assessed by placing a periodontal probe, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, in the next tooth. If you see a periodontal probe through the gingiva, it shows that gingiva is very thin, which is called as a thin, thin biotype. Thin bio. If your biotype is very thin, the problem with implant is that, you know, uh, the implant abutment junction or even the implant itself, the black color can be shown through the gingiva. And then thin ginger well biotype uh, would also indicate less keratinization of the gingiva, which can result in uh, gingival breakdown in future and bacterial ingress also. Okay, sir. Uh, how much distance should be there between the implant and the maxillary sinus? Implant. Um, actually, there is uh, a limitation 
when you place implants in the lower, what they say is your uh, implant effect should be two millimeter above the inferior alveolar nerve to prevent a, a nerve injury to the implant. But sinus, there is, uh, and actually there is no such uh, limitation. But you can, uh, if you are a beginner, you can place it just below the sinus. If you think that you know the uh, the height is less, then you can always do a sinus uh, lift procedure or a sinus graft procedure, and uh, to result in a you know uh, adequately long implant uh, to be placed below the sinus or within the sinus. So somebody has uh, also asked, what is sinus lift? Uh, sinus lift is you know. Uh, the sinus is a hollow cavity which is lined by uh, a membrane, a sinus membrane, and uh, it is recommended that you should not pierce the sinus membrane. So when uh, presently sh there are short implants which are available, which is from six mm long to eight mm, is presently said as uh, you know short implants. Uh, but you know if you want to place a longer implant there, what you can do is you can uh, do a sinus lift procedure. So there are two uh, sinus lift is you know and in, it's called as an indirect sinus lift procedure. Otherwise called as a summers lift procedure in which you drill, you make an osteotomy uh, preparation till the base of the sinus floor. And then what you do is you will mallet. You will use a mallet to tap and break the sinus floor, and uh, with which you raise the sinus membrane along with the sinus floor. And then you can place a uh, you know longer implant there. Another technique is called as a direct sinus lift, in which you raise a flap and then you uh, you prepare a window and you cut open this window and you raise the sinus membrane along with the window. And then yeah, thanks Pravish for putting that slide. Yes, and then the sinus membrane is is raised like this, and then you place a graft underneath the sinus membrane and then you place the implant. So this is called as a sinus lift procedure. So there are two uh, procedures. One is a sinus, summer sinus lift, which is a indirect sinus lift and a direct sinus grafting technique. Right, sir. So uh, next question is, in one of the cases that you showed here, there was less than 1.5 mm clearance between the abutment and the gingiva. And the gingiva? Uh, and the next and, two? And the gingiva is what the doctor has asked uh, right. must be be right. between the implants they might have meant between the implants or between, or between and teeth and implant yeah. it would be helpful if you could say how you managed it um you know it was probably my first or fifth case of implantology and um, you know i was also taken aback during the uh, impression stage because i found that uh, i found that the impression post is touching the next to then it's not going in so I had to trim, if you check the, uh, do you want me to screen share that again? I had trimmed the distal surface of the uh, impression post yes. and uh, in that way, the impression post went in. So I had to trim the impression post in that case. Uh, and what Probably about sir, when it uh, went to the abutment stage, was the abutment also fitting or you went for a customized abutment? Uh, it was a customized abutment, yeah. Okay. And uh, when was this done, sir? Way back in which time? Way back, probably in 2007 or 2008. Okay. Thank you. Right. How can we do a surgical stent and how to calculate the drill with the stent? Uh, stent? Uh, tell me again. How can you... Um, Manufacture. How can you... So can you show how to do a surgical stent? and how to calculate the drill with stent that is a question here so uh, how to, how in the question answer it? yeah in the uh, in your uh, computer screen there's a small uh, button called q and a can you see that with the 10 you asking me yeah yeah yes sir yes sir right right right, right. yeah yeah, yeah. please you, press you that button you can yeah. you can read the questions which has come so i guess it'll be more clear one dr arun prakash the second question yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you show how to do a surgical stent and how to calculate the drill? Yeah, that portion is not clear. How to make a surgical stent is... Uh, you know, pro probably they are talking about the final drill, sir. Yeah, yeah. That should be based on uh, implant selection, isn't it, sir? 
Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I can answer that. So how would you make a surgical stent? That's the first question. So just an RPD will act as a surgical stent if you want. If you want to uh, cut down cost, you make an, just an RPD and drill a hole through the central groove. That itself will uh, uh, suffice for a, a surgical stent. But you can also order a, a S6 retainer and then drill through it. Um, but if you want to uh, exactly, uh, you know, calculate the drill width with it, there's something called as a surgical stent, uh, a, a, a guided surgery stent, which you can make. If you go for a guided surgery stent that is made by the company or the lab, which, which will have different sleeves according to the uh, size of the each drill that you're going to place in, in say, inside. So the, it will um, have a sleeve that you can place for a pilot drill and you remove that sleeve, you place the next sleeve for the a two mm drill, then you can remove it, then you can place a three mm sleeve for the three mm drill. Like that, you can progressively increase uh, the drill sizes if you are going for a surgical, uh, uh, a guided surgical stain. Did I answer you, Arun? Yeah, I guess. Uh, let him come up with the question again. If, yes, yeah. it's not clear. So, the next question, sir uh, How to select external hex or internal hex? Yeah. yeah. External hex was um, the type of implant that previously, uh, during the time of, uh, you know, when implant came into market, they tried to, all these implants were external hex. Why the external hex was uh, incorporated into an implant is that it, it, external hex acted uh, or the, the hexes will benefit in fitting a spanner on the implant and then they used to drive the spanner uh, by catching it onto the external hex and that is how the implants were inserted into the osteotomy in the olden days. But later they found that, you know, external hex will, um, you know, reduce the internal, sorry, the, the inter occlusal space that you have. So they thought of, uh, and then abutment screw loosening started happening. So they, they thought of, uh, you know, making it internal hex. So that is uh, later they found out, you know, uh, when you make an internal hex, uh, it is more easy to drive the, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the forces of the implant will go directly into the, uh, into the implant. And uh, that is the difference between an internal and an external hex. So presently they say that, you know, um, when you place all on four, it is good that you uh, place an external hex implant so that you don't need to, especially those implants which are tilted. Uh, if you um, place external hex, then you don't need to uh, fetch for the implant because already the hex will be a little bit longer and it will uh, probably stay uh, outside or just beneath the uh, gingiva. So it will be easy to fetch for the external hex implant. Yeah. yeah. So the next question, uh, what affects more, diameter or the length of the implant? Okay. Oh, what affects more, diameter or the length of the implant? Yeah, diameter is uh, said to be uh, more critical than the length of the implant. Why? Because it is uh, the time it's at the crest that uh, the which takes up most of the force. So stresses will be dissipated at the crest. That is, crest is the region where the the force uh, uh, is is uh, you know impinged onto the uh, to the implant. So Crest will take up most of the forces. So it is said that, you know, the, 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 if the maximum width that is possible for that crest should be selected than the length of the implant. So width of the crest is more important than the length of the implant. But generally it is said that uh, an implant should be uh, 10 millimeter long to, uh, generally they say that, you know, an adequately long implant is 10 millimeter implant. So please give us some tips in implant maintenance, like scaling, with respect to a general practitioner. Oh, scaling, they say that you know you should not use your ordinary metal scalers because metal uh, can uh, scratch the implant surface, which can lead to even further incorporation of food debris into the onto the implant surface. So uh, you get uh, plastic scalers. And uh, you know titanium scalers, plastic scalers. I've tried plastic scalers, and it won't uh, you know remove the uh, 
calculus like you know metal scalars so if you are using metal scalars uh, it is good to use titanium scalars uh, because titanium uh, will scratch the titanium implant less lesser than any other metal so that is how you should scale the over the implant tip and maintenance space i have i had uh, described during my presentation about how yes, to sir. maintain how to use intended vibration uh, specific implant brushes it has to be taught to the patient and uh, does the titanium uh, do we get it for our regular uh, scaler scaling device or you have a special scaling device for implant? i have read that i know you you get special hand scalers which are made of titanium oh okay uh, and i've read that you know you get uh, plastic tips which can be put uh, like a sleeve over your ordinary uh, type uh, ordinary uh, ultrasonic okay. scaler tips okay but i've not come i've not uh, procured one but i just read about it thank you sir and so what is your opinion about densa sinus lift can you uh, I have not used densa burst to do sinus grafting, uh, sinus lifting, but I have used uh, densa burst to uh, expand bone, and it works very well. Okay, thank you. Your opinion about basal implant? It's very common nowadays. I have not tried this. <laughs> thank you. So the next question is: How long can an implant stay in the mouth successfully if the patient has placed at the age of twenty-five years? Or will it get displaced by aging? generally it doesn't get uh, displaced just because the patient is getting aged but if we there are many factors for implant failure probably we'll have a seminar on implant failure later but yeah. you know generally if the patient is healthy uh, you know if he's a, a non smoker if he's uh, not if doesn't have uncontrolled diabetes um, and uh, his period status is good generally implants are there to stay if you google it says that you know implant treatment is about 90 to 95 to 99 percent successful so age doesn't matter okay uh, what is better immediate or delayed implant placement considering the survival rate and no rig augmentation needs to be done dr kananji can you see the question sir the second one from top each has got its, its own uh, indication sometimes uh, you know you cannot just uh, classify every patient as an immediate uh, implant patient sometimes you know when you think of placing an immediate implant uh, they say that immediate implant uh, you know the torque should be uh, over 45 newton sometimes you think that this patient is a good patient for immediate implant you might get 45 newton but when you place an implant you know you may not get that much of primary stability Uh, in grafted cases, you cannot do an immediate implant, uh, and then uh, you know the, the, the immediate implant situation is uh, probably li uh, limited. Uh, but you know uh, uh, other indications, you know you will have to go for uh, delayed implant placement. Is there any technique to know whether the yeah hello? Is there any technique to know? whether the osteo integration has been performed properly in a soft core after implantation specifically asking about resonance technique yeah 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 resonance technique can be done yeah osteo can be used i think uh, you know it's called as radio frequency analysis i i i just forgot that yeah resonance testing by means of osteo the company is called osteo you can use that okay. then there guided is a question guided versus hand surgery yeah. yeah guided versus hand surgery hello sir so can you hear me hello sir Yeah, yeah, please go ahead yeah. with the question. Yeah. So, what are functionally graded a, a dental implants? Functionally graded dental implants. I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. 
in case of bar attached over denture please explain the maintenance practices that should be done uh, yeah bar uh, yeah bar attached over denture uh, should have um, if you're going for a bar there should be at least 18 millimeter of uh, space between the crest of the uh, uh, from the gingiva to the uh, incisal uh, plane of the opposing teeth then only you will have adequate space for maintenance under the bar so under the bar at least there should be a minimum of three millimeter space under the bar so you can use the interdental brush or the way you can uh, you know tie a floss around the the bar and then you can go horizontal and vertically you can move also you can use your uh, you know water pick to uh, you know water flosser under the, the bar yeah maintenance under the bar is is of prime importance in multiple implants do you place multi pin abutments instead of the conventional gingival healing abutment multi pin abutment i don't know the meaning of multi pin okay so again coming to scalers sir do you recommend any company just let me write it down i don't know what multi pin yeah no i don't i don't have any specific recommendations for that multi pin abutments all right yeah how do you select the diameter of a healing abutment it depends upon the the emergence profile that you want if you want a better emergence profile then you can uh, opt for a bigger wider uh, diameter uh, gingival former or you can even customize the diameter of the gingival former the minimum time required to place an implant to place an implant means what uh, probably after extraction after extraction yeah maybe 3 to 4 months is a good time to place an implant after extraction so that you will have you know immature bone within the socket which you can uh, probably shift uh, to the buccal side you can condense it to the buccal side and you can place an implant so minimum of 3 to 4 months what what if it is a case of immediate implant sir immediate yeah you, you can place an implant immediately also yeah yeah in a patient with bruxism can we place an implant so what are the precautions to be taken yeah bruxers are always a problem for dentistry not just for implant but in bruxer if you want to place an implant then they always say that you know you should use the widest implant that is possible one secondly is that you should over engineer meaning if you can place more implants in that patient uh, you know if one implant rubberment screw breaks still you can utilize uh, you can carry on with the same processes or you can uh, place some sleeping implants for this patient and then you can uh, utilize that those implants later on uh, for a bruxer and also they recommend that you should give a night guard for this patient the so the sleeping implant would be always submerged when until until when you are actually require it isn't it sir yeah. yeah 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 you know just just for to as a precaution you can even try placing sleeping implants for bruxers and then utilize them but over, always over engineer to so give more number of implants keep the wide give the widest implant possible for that situation and a night guard okay so the next question we have we have combined to one question was that how to uh, read and cbct and the next question is how to do virtual implant planning place implant placement planning so that's a huge yeah. topic cbct uh, to read a cbct you have to learn you you can talk to your cbct center to teach you how to learn uh, uh, reading a cbct uh, uh, and probably. i would always recommend probably yeah. they they are talking about how to uh, find the dimension and all i think it comes with the software and uh, you can use the software yeah. to measure it yeah it's not very difficult to learn that you i think you should learn uh, you know asking your 
TB city center, and then uh, it's not very difficult to learn that. Virtual and implant placement planning. Yeah, same. That question is answered. Okay. Uh, yeah. Multi-unit abutments. That is what he was talking about. No, the previous question. Which the previous question. Which uh, previous question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In multiple implants, do you multi place multi-unit abutments? Multi-unit abutments. Yeah. Yeah, multi-unit abutments is always not uh, required for uh, you know multiple implants. Multi-unit uh, abutment is uh, required when you need to uh, in an all-on-four case or or so. So multi-unit abutments are more expensive also. So I don't generally place multi-unit uh, abutments otherwise indicated. Okay. What should be the minimum vertical the height in a, in a mandibular implant supported over denture? Ball attachment. What should be the minimum vertical height in a mandibular implant supported over denture? Similarly, uh, as I said, you should have at least 18 millimeter of bone, uh, sorry, of interoclusive space from the opposing plane. So that, you know, uh, otherwise you will see that, you know, uh, your uh, process's thickness will be very less. Even if uh, you give a metal reinforced uh, denture, it might break or the, the, the ball will be shown through if you go for a, a reduced interact space. Uh, maybe 15 to 18 millimeter of interest space should be there for a bar, uh, sorry, a, a ball attachment even. But presently, you know, you get um, locators and um, locator uh, attachments, you can, uh, you know, you get even uh, one millimeter or even zero millimeter uh, height of uh, uh, locator. So in reduced interest space, you can still use a, a locator with, you know, minimum um, height of the Locator attachment. Okay, sir. So next question. In case of localized periodontitis, and the tooth has become mobile. Harish, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Dr. Unikrishna is asking. In, in, in case of localized periodontitis, and the tooth has become mobile, can delayed implant treatment be done if the patient is not medically compromised? When should a bone graft be done if required? Sir, can you hear me? Mm. Sir, hello? Hello? Ravish, can you hear me? Yeah, audible, but I think Sir has lost his connection. Sir has lost his connection. Yeah, I lost you in between. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sir, sir the, the question, question was on... Uh, and nobody the yeah, okay, sir. Endopore. We will go to that first. Yeah, endopore implants, um, you know, it's a, it was considered to be the one of the roughest implants in once upon a time. I don't know whether it is still available. Endopore implants, they don't have any threads. They've got globules of titanium all around. The problem with imp uh, the endopore implants is that since it is not threaded, it is usually uh, tapped into the osteotomy site, an underprepared osteotomy, and is made, and then you tap the uh, implant into the uh, osteotomy. So that is what we generally do. And the problem with endopore is that, you know, uh, if bacterial ingress happens onto the first globule, and it's very easy for the bacteria to, uh, to you know, go in between the uh, endopore implants are still available in the market. Okay. So the next question, in case of localized periodontitis, and the and tooth has become mobile. Can we delay the implant uh, treatment if the patient is not medically compromised? When should the bone graft be done if required? I hope you understood the question, sir. Can you read the question? Yes. Uh, Probably they are asking about the a tooth before extraction, so it has localized periodontitis and it is mobile. So after extraction, uh, we should be preferring, preferably we should be going for delayed implant, isn't it, sir? Yeah, you can do a delayed implant, uh, yeah, in that case, yeah. And uh, when should bone graft be done if required? Uh, will, will, you, will we do it immediately after extracting a periodontally compromised teeth uh, or you can do it 
along with implant placement or something like that, sir? Yeah, generally it is not done along with uh, extraction. If you're doing a delayed implant placement, yeah. then it depends upon the bone situation. And uh, Can we try for socket preservation or something? Yeah, you can even still try because, you know, you cannot do socket preservation because anyway the tooth has come out. So That's nothing will be left. <laughs> the, I think that is and what, what bone grafts do you prefer in sinus lift? That's one more question you have some. Oh yeah, yeah. bone graft. Um, I usually mix allo graft with uh, synthetic graft. Allo graft from Rocky Mountain with synthetic graft, like bio or something. Any other instruments other than mallet and instruments for sinus lifting procedures in can pieces. So yeah, you can use piezo reamers for uh, piece, sorry piezo surgery for uh, making a window. And osteotomes, yeah, there are many different uh, you know techniques that have come. You can use hydraulic lift procedures. You can use a denser bird to. Uh, uh, sir, sir, would you mind me reading out the question for others? The question which had come was any other instruments other than mallet and osteotomes for sinus lifting procedures or any hand pieces which can be used. Yeah, so uh, you can use mallet, you can use um, denser bird, you can use a hydro, uh, you know, uh, lifting procedures uh, with saline. You can um, lift uh, the sinus and then when to make a window, you can use a, a piece of surgical instrument to make a window rather than going for a, a hand piece. And again, sir, regarding your grafting, uh, it has been asked whether you do the same for all the cases. No, I don't do grafting for all the cases. Only if it's no, sir, if, 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 if grafting is required, do you follow the same procedure for all grafting? Uh, same procedure mean? Uh, so no you uh, talk, mix, talked about the graft material mixing now, sir. Probably. The... No, sometimes, you know, if uh, I do scrapings of... Um, from the cortical plate and then I mix it with my graft in place. It depends. Okay. I think almost we are done, sir. There were many questions regarding can we give implant to a patient who smokes every day? There were a few questions by a few participants regarding smoker and implant. Uh, generally, it is said that you know smoking uh, is quite a contraindication for implant. But you know, um, they say if you stop smoking for about uh, three weeks before the implant placement uh, and uh, four weeks after the implant placement, probably you can uh, get away with such patients. But generally, for uh, and, people, and if they, they manage to do so, they can actually stop the habit also. Yeah, this can be utilized as a uh, time a lockdown period for. Um, you know, smoking. stopping blend. Uh, sorry, sorry, for stopping smoking too. And if you have grafted, uh, that definitely that patient should not smoke for at least one or two months. The, there are a few more questions in your Q and A session, sir. Yeah. So snappy impression. Uh, a few words about that, sir. Snappy impression. Snappy impression copings. Snappy impression technique. Yes, sir. Okay, a snap, snappy impression is uh, usually for a closed tray uh, technique. The uh, abutment is placed onto the implant and the snappy impression coping is placed onto the uh, abutment. And then when you pick it up, the, the, the top portion or the snappy portion of the, uh, of the impression that you, of the impression coping that you place over the abutment will get incorporated into the impression. And then you need to remove the abutment and place it back into the snappy impression coping. That is how we do it. It's a closed tray impression technique, snappy impression. Right, so that's all the questions in the chat. Now yep. uh, we can look at the questions at the question answer session in the question answer window. Is lack of intraocclusal space an absolute contraindication? 
Yes. Oh, I've come across situations in which I have placed implants and then a uh, patient did not allow me to uh, do an enomeroplasty on the opposite tooth or the next tooth. So this has to be, uh, you know, taken care of. That's the thing. Before you start an implant placement. What you do is you make it fast and then you uh, recognize how much of uh, interoclusive space you have. Minimum of uh, four to five millimeter of interoclusive space is required for uh, screwable processes. But at least seven millimeter of interoclusive space should be there for uh, placing a cementable process. But if there is no space at all, then it's difficult. You have to create space by doing a, uh, you know, um, root canal for the opposing tooth or so, and to create a space if, if it has super erupted. So minimum of five to seven millimeter should be there for uh, any plan processes. In case an implant failed to, failed to osteointegrate, what can be done? Can the implant replace on the same site? Say again. If in case an implant has failed, has failed to osteointegrate, what can be done? Can the implant be replaced in the same site? See, it depends upon uh, the reason why it, why, why it failed. Probably because of excess force or infection, if it has failed, then it's better to wait for uh, three to four months for the socket to heal. You cure at the socket and uh, for the uh, socket to heal. But if you still feel that you know the socket is okay, uh, there is no infection in that, then uh, you can probably try placing a wider implant in that situation rather than placing the same implant because it may you know once the implant comes off, then that same implant may not fit in. So it is good to place a wider implant if you feel that you know there is no infection or uh, you know if you can manage the excess force that has resulted in uh, implant failure or so. And if you want to place an implant uh, direct, I mean, uh, immediately, then you can probably opt in for a uh, wider implant at that point. Okay, sir, I guess that completes our question. Uh, I think two more questions are there in that. Uh, um, What's the problem if we give an immediate implant after extraction? And one more question is what precaution you have to take for immediate implant for anterior tooth soon after extraction of a teeth which is not infected. So both are uh, pertaining to immediate implant implant placement. Sir. Okay, you can give an immediate implant uh, situation, uh, uh, immediate implant if uh, you get a primary stability of more than 40 Newton. Some companies they recommend about um, you know, 50 to 60 newtons for immediate implant based uh, for immediate implant based. But the processes that you give on an immediate implant, that's a precaution that you take. Uh, immediate implants, uh, uh, you know, prosthetic rehabilitation cannot be done if you need to graft that immediately implanted site. One. Secondly, uh, is that you know you give a processes. You don't give a definitive process. What you give is a provisional processes, which is usually made of acrylic processes. Um, so that you know, even if some force comes over there, the acrylic will get abraded and you will usually keep it out of proportion. So those are the uh, precautions that you take. No, I, I, think, I think we have done with the doubt clearing part. Uh, if at all anyone wants to ask some questions, you may do that. If anyone wants to uh, uh, talk with the faculty, you can use the raise hand option in your, uh, in your phone or your laptop. And we we can let you speak with the uh, present uh, with the speaker. You can interact with him. Uh, Doctor Divisri wants to talk to you, sir. Hi, sir. Hello, Divisri. Divisri, you're... Have... Hello. Yeah, your mic was on. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's fine now. Hello. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I have a patient who is uh, 63 years, and he had done the implant. Uh, I think eight years before. 
Hello. Yeah, you are audible. And please the bridge in the low. Hello. You are audible. You are audible. So can you hear, hear I can hear me? You. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. You can. Uh, he has got a uh, now. Hello. Yeah, he. Hello. Got, he has got. Uh, he has got food impaction and uh, some sort of gingival inflammation now. But uh, what will we we do if we want to remove that bridge or uh, just do the scaling part? That's enough. He is putting uh, putting back in the bridge uh, that implant supported bridge. So uh, is and some sort of uh, gingival inflammation is also there. Uh, so okay. now screwable processes or a cemented processes. Uh, Eight years back, sir. Cemented Probably it must be cemented. If it is cemented, then cemented, uh, cemented. Yeah, obviously, then it will be very difficult for you to remove uh, the processes uh, to make a new one to meet uh, the space underneath the bridge. Uh, okay. And uh, since it is not your case, you have to uh, tell the patient prior that you know mm -hmm. one. If you want to remove the bridge, then you know you may have to sacrifice the processes. It will be a very difficult uh, procedure for you to drill in through the uh, occlusal surface to reach the abutment screw and to remove it. You might uh, damage the abutment screw, the top of the abutment screw, when you drill through on. So uh, okay. the, you have to get a consent form from the patient, and uh, not just from the patient, from the bystanders also, the family members also. That you know one. Acid, um, or you may damage the uh, abutment screw, which is all a problem in, in this situation. So, if the patient is ready for all that, then and, and if he wants to remove it, then it's always good to do for you to remove it, uh, drill in through the, uh, the occlusal surface. And if the problem is you don't know whether the screw hole, uh, the access hole, which is placed, um, which has been made by the other dentist, is the occlusal surface or it is in the buccal surface or not. So okay, okay. it's a little bit tricky to remove a cemented bridge. But presently, if you can teach him interdental cleaning aids, or if you can give him uh, a water pick uh, to okay. use, and then okay. let him try that for some time, and then mm -hmm. uh, if it uh, you know uh, helps, then it is better than you removing the bridge in such okay, situation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, hope you are fine. And yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, yeah, I was okay. locked down in Calicut. Ah, uh, it's fine. <laughs> Horrible, actually. Horrible. Sitting bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, most welcome. Uh, so, one more question uh, that is pertaining to implant failure. So, after placement of the implant and crown, and everything comes off after seven months, if patient files a litigation or there's a court case, um, now who will take care of the cost? Will the insurance take care of the cost? That's the question they had asked, actually. Can you uh, repeat the question? Uh, implant fails after seven months. The implant and the crown comes off. And uh, what will happen if the patient files a case? Uh, do we need to get insured to cover the cost of uh, case or the failure of implant? That's the question they had asked. Um, when I had implant failures happening in my uh, practice, what I started uh, thinking and uh, what I've developed is a uh, implant failure policy that you know i've made a policy uh, of myself like if the implant fails before uh, it has been loaded before the prosthetic phase then it means that you know the uh, implant has been has served no good to the patient so uh, i will take the surgical cost and i'll uh, repay a certain amount uh, of the uh, you know payment back to the patient if the implant fails in uh, maybe in one year, so I'll take so much of amount and then repay this much. If the implant fails after uh, three years, this is the cost which I'll, I'll repay. And uh, the patient has to be uh, coming to you regularly for maintenance checkups. You will take X-rays and all the uh, um, you know the the hygienic measures, and the patient should be uh, you know should not have uncontrolled diabetes. He should not be a non-smoker. So certain conditions I have to place. So this I'll tell the patient prior to, to my implant placement. So uh, that is 
uh, how I do, so that you know you can prevent patient going for a litigation because you know you have, you have never promised the patient that your implant is to uh, is going to stay for life. There are many factors that implant uh, could fail. So you tell the patient prior, you make an implant failure policy, and then you know your own policy, and then you give to the patient before they uh, or when you discuss the implant, and then you get it signed from the patient. So that is how you can get away. I don't know about you know insurance or not. This is how I do. So there are two more questions. One is in case of a mild degree of peri implantitis, will just scaling and medications reverse the damage? It depends upon the uh, degree of peri implantitis. Um, in mild cases, sir, mild cases does mild it actually cases, reverse, yeah, yeah, or you need to keep on maintaining it? Yeah, just scaling and uh, you know even without medication, mild cases you know. If you scale and then uh, teach the patient proper uh, maintenance, then it will reverse. But beyond a certain stage, if there is bone loss, then it is very difficult to reverse the case. Okay, sir. So, what's your opinion about fast tracking full the full fast tracking rehab? Impressions, I, I love that concept uh, because you know it it saves you. Uh, what's the name of the page, uh, the person who has sent that message? Please, I would like to know that. Uh, fast tracking is by Doctor Munir. He's a prosthodontist. Yeah, fast tracking uh, impression is, is a beautiful technique uh, because you know it saves you a lot of headache, uh, like you know jig trial and uh, you know the 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 trying of the uh, uh, of the metal. It, it, fast tracking is so good. Yeah. Um. Anything more, Dr. Unikrishna? Probably they can WhatsApp in the group if they want. Uh, yes, I think uh, one yeah. more person has raised their hand. Dr. Aisha Jalil, I think. Doctor, doctor, you may unmute yourself and ask question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello. Okay. You're, you're audible now. Okay, okay. Thank you, yeah, Dr. The video for also. Pravish, yeah. be good. No, sir. We, do, uh, we cannot allow in this mode, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, doctor, for your uh, beautiful presentation. And, and I, I would like to add on, uh, Dr. Aisha was the one with who had many questions, many doubts she had, actually. <laughs> okay. I hope uh, I was okay. able to answer most of your questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Uh, okay, uh, doctor, uh, can you explain how about this uh, using, uh, breaking uh, osteotomy with uh, surgical stent? Yeah, surgical stent, uh, I had explained this before. Uh, surgical stent can be uh, made with just like a, if you make an RPD and then if you drill through the... Yeah, that, uh, that, I, that I understood. Uh, I'm asking whether you will do this uh, elevating the flap or you just drill through the uh, gingiva when okay. you place this uh, yeah, surgical stent. If, if you just go uh, blindly following the surgical stent, without raising a flap, most of the time, because the buccal uh, yeah. particle plate resorbs faster, and then probably there'll be more of a gingival thickness there. If you don't raise a flap after you mark uh, through the uh, surgical stent, then most of the time, you if you raise a flap and you'll see your uh, initial, the, your initial osteotomy would have gone more buccally than being yeah, depressed. Yeah. You might think yeah. that if you just use the uh, blindly follow the surgical stent, uh, what happens is because of the resorption of the buccal plate, most of the time uh, your uh, osteotomy may, be, may, may have gone uh, you know, uh, in a different direction. So, so it's always to use the surgical, use the ordinary stent that we use in the initial, uh, to mark the initial pilot drill. And then oh, you okay. raise the flap or just okay. mark, pierce through the gingiva and reach okay. the bone, put a, yeah. uh, a bleeding spot on the uh, bone, bone and then you raise yeah. the flap. Okay. And then you see clinically where your uh, marking is. And okay. then you can judge, then you can decide whether to you know, proceed with the same, uh, at the same region or you need to you know, shift your angulation or your, even your osteotomy. So don't uh, I, just believe the guide. Even if it's a surgical guide, also don't believe it completely. Okay, okay. So okay. I did uh, enter for uh, two cases was failed. Um, I used the smallest uh, implant 
in the maxilla but the uh, bone bone was very little i think about 5 mm so i used the shortest enterpore uh, 5 mm long uh, ah yeah length it was very short is that 5 uh, mm like long is, uh, you mean or 5 mm big uh, i used the width uh, i length like length, length, between length. Uh, the Which below the si below the sinus below endopore i used endopore i think it is the shortest one available right 5 mm which which company produces 5 mm no, uh, no i i think i used endopore 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it was, it failed so that's why i asked what is it i used them 2009 2009 long uh, back long back yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i don't think it is still uh, it is available Endopore uh, is still available. Yeah. Still available. Yeah. Doctor, I am uh, working in Saudi Arabia. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it still available there? Uh, right now, I don't know because I did it long past. So I am not uh, because at that time we it was available uh, with our uh, agent like uh, the supplier. It was only the endopore available. So I started doing with the endopore. So two of my cases oh. failed, single tooth, but one bridge still it is okay with endopore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So while I was doing the course, I did the many cases with replace, select, or uh, all these things. I did. I used it to three, two, three systems while doing okay. this uh, course. So it was okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, most so I, I think uh, rest of the doubts. uh you you may please ask in us through whatsapp and uh, we will be uh, having that uh, group uh, in, intact for at least 3 uh, 4 days and uh, you may interact with sir in that group and thank you sir for the amazing session i uh, i i think uh, dr unni so next Hello? Uh, uh, yeah. dr shaju our president i idea malwa would yeah. like to Say a few words, sir. Is there? Uh, to thank you and the attendees who have attended. Shaju, sir, can you please unmute yourself? Sir, you have to do it. Uh, Hello, yes, sir. You, you are audible yeah. now. Shaju, sir. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Elder Koshi, for having a wonderful session. Yeah, most. I I have attended one of your implant course at Chalapudi once. Oh really? That's great. Do you remember me? Yeah, I remember you. Yeah, I my I think my wife was my my wife was a senior in Salem. Really? What's your name? Shebi. Shebi. Shebi Pugurin from Mangalore. She was Santosh Thomas in that night. Santosh Thomas. So that that means senior. Yes, senior. Only one year senior, I mean. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I know her. Okay. Let uh, few more things. Let Manoj come. Manoj, yeah, yeah, I know her. I know her. Yeah, yeah. Dinesh, 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 Dinesh. Yeah. Yeah. They were all my friends. I, I think few of them are already there in. Uh, uh, Dinesh sir is there in our. Uh, uh, Dinesh sir is there, and I think Manoj sir also was there uh, in the presentation. Yeah, he's there. He, he, he told me just. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Dinesh sir and Manoj. Um, uh, Dinesh sir, you can actually uh, switch on your video and uh, sound now if you want to interact with the faculty. Doctor Madhavan Gutti, would you like to add something to it? Would you like to ask some doubt? We will take a short time. Doubt, short time. Ah. Correct. The same tool. No, no. Kimbal and I are going to pull it to be a little something. Yeah, yeah. I am going to graft. I am going to do a kind of graft. Idiot and all. Ah, tooth. Ne. Yeah. You. You can. You can extract the tooth and uh, you know uh, use the same tooth as a graft material. Yeah, that's a concept. Next one, next one, another graft. I want to get that one. Not, not much. 
അങ്ങനെ ഏറ്റവും നല്ല ഗ്രാഫ്റ്റ് അങ്ങനെ ഒരു ഗ്രാഫ്റ്റ് ഇല്ല ആക്ച്വലി യു ഹാവ് ടു വാട്ട് അബൌട്ട് ദാറ്റ് നോ ബോൺ ഗ്രാഫ് ദാറ്റ് നോ ബോൺ ഇസ് ആൾസോ എ സിന്തറ്റിക് ഗ്രാഫ് ഇറ്റ് ഹസ് ഗോട്ട് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൺ അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ആൻഡ് ഡിസ്അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ഓക്കേ മനോജ് മനോജ് Manoj sir, I cannot find among the group. Dr. Dinesh is there, sir. Hello. Hello. Sushya is not Dinesh. Ah, Sushya. Video is not there. Okay, 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 okay. Sandosham. Oh, hello, 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 hello. Kandil Sandosham, Kandil Sandosham. പിന്നെ നമ്മള് ഞാൻ കാലിക്കറ്റ് വന്നപ്പോഴും കണ്ടിരുന്നു സുഖമായിരിക്കുന്നു So thank you Eldo, I'm not in the class. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you sir for sparing us all this time for thank this you. webinar. Thank you sir. Okay.